we speak to them. Talking about brushing out on Mandarin, the whole idea about culture is very interesting because uh, language sometimes is a way to break barriers to be able to gain inroads. Uh, so instead of being divided by languages, uh, language actually, if we are able to learn a certain language, it helps us to break that barriers that divides us. Uh, but sometimes we are also divided by other aspects that we have held so distinctive about ourselves, but has divided us from the people group and also uh, prevented the gospel from being uh, preached into those people group. There's a story about two apples up in the tree who were looking down on the world and the first apple said, look, look at all these people divided due to discrimination, ostracizing and killing one another. No one seems to be willing to get along with the fellow man. Someday we apples will be the only ones left. Then we will rule the world. Second apple replied to the first apple saying, which of us, the green or the red apples? When a people group becomes too distinct, too inward looking, we become like bad apples of the bunch. It becomes exclusivism. It divides mankind. For example, in the United States, I don't know if you have been reading the news, but we read of how Asians are now the target of racial abuse. Lately, there are news of Singaporeans who are discriminating uh, the staff, the Tan Tok Sing Hospital nurses. Uh, when the cluster of COVID-19 first appeared. And the discrimination was to the point it was rude and inconsiderate, forgetting that these are the frontline workers who, putting, who are putting their own life at risk each day. We see uh, keyboard warriors who use online internet forums discriminating against the, funeral, uh, the, the foreigners. Uh, even before the pandemic has begun, we've seen this trend that is going online regularly. But what about the modern day church? Are we the same? Years ago, I was able to talk to a friend of mine who, was a, who is sorry, a youth pastor uh, of a particular church in Singapore. And because of his giftedness, he was able to reach uh, youth of a certain demographics, youth of the heartlands, you know, they are from the neighborhood, uh, most of them are from broken families, and these youths are typically rowdy, you know, they are easily bored during services, they will take out their phones and they will play with them, they are dressed in a certain way, they are talking in a certain way, and I met some of these young people, yeah, despite their differences, so to speak, they are warm, friendly, and authentic young people, they haven't gotten to know Christ yet, but they are willing to come to the church. The only heartache that my friend faced was that some of the adults, some of the church members, which both youth and, young, and adults alike, sees the young people as them rather than as us. They've gone on to even label some of the youths as misfits because they don't fit into the church culture or even the church lingo, language, style of learning, style of growing, and even uh, their educational level their education level, even the way they engage in the scriptures. They're slower sometimes. They may not understand certain language or technical terms. That's why it takes them time. And my friend was heartbroken. He confided in me and said, how do we move forward from here? You know, it's the danger when a church keeps the gospel to ourselves. Distinctions that divided rather than draw people. And that brings us to Acts chapter 10. Acts 10 is also about a distinction that divided. And the distinction was that the Jews were divided from the Gentiles in the way they view the Gentiles. And so in order to engage Acts chapter 10 this morning, I propose to us to see three points. First, three key conversions prior to Acts chapter 10 that are important to us. Two visions, one to a man named Cornelius and to the other to the Apostle Peter, and one attitude change that marked the beginning of the church in Rome and the gospel to the Romans. Three key conversions, two visions, one attitude. And hopefully by the end of the sermon, zero divide between us and the people that surround us. As we dive into God's words this morning, may I encourage you to take your Bibles and let us and flip to Acts chapter 10 and let us prepare to receive God's words this morning. Let's open it with a word of prayer. 
Dear God, speak to us, reveal to us about our own distinctions, or what we perceive as our distinctions that have caused divides. Distinctions that are not biblical. Distinctions due to our own pride, perhaps. Lord, we ask that this morning you reveal and you remove them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First of all, three key conversions uh, that we see from Acts chapter 8 to chapter 9. And so we have to do a little bit of review to understand because in the context of these three chapters, 8, 9, and 10, there is a theme, an exciting thing that God is doing. God is beginning to fulfill His promises to the Gentiles that we read in the Old Testament, fulfilled in Jesus Christ that we see right now in the book of Acts that is coming alive. We see first the conversions of the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 to 25. We see the, e the Ethiopian who was converted in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 and verse 240. And then we see the conversion of Saul, not only to his name Paul, but to the apostle, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 9. Now, some of us will read this and perhaps think, wow, that's the fulfillment of what Christ has commanded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 that we will be His witnesses to the church, will be the witnesses to Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Yes, it is. But there's a clear theme here going in the background that the Gentiles are now being converted and will now share in the blessings of God. Now, you might say, hey, wait a minute. Yes, David, you're right. The Samaritans and the Ethiopians were considered Gentiles. But Saul, Saul is a Jew. He's not a Gentile. Yes, you're right. But if you read carefully, you realize that Paul isn't a Gentile who was converted, but part of God's calling for Paul's ministry was also to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 9, verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he, was, he is a chosen instrument, he being Paul. Uh, he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul himself wrote in Romans chapter 15, verse 15 to 16, and he says, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Before we go even further, we had asked ourselves then, who is a Gentile? The word Gentile means people, nations. But the term and understanding from a Jew is that it doesn't describe who someone is, but it actually describes who someone isn't. Therefore, the person who is not a, Gen not a Jew belonging to any, and belonging to any nation or people group other than the Jewish people group is known as a Gentile. So from the Jewish perspective, Gentiles were often seen as people who are pagans who did not know God. God gave Israel His laws uh, written in stone in Exodus chapter 20 and meant, it was meant to build Israel out to be a nation that was supposed to be distinct from the nations that, is around them, that was around them. Israel had access to God's forgiveness and presence as we read in Leviticus chapter 16 and had the promises of God, such as Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. There was, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your, fa and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be a blessing through you. So this was the promise that God has given to Israel. And if you fast forward to Jesus' time, you see that the Jews had taken such pride in their religious and cultural background that they considered the Gentiles as unclean, even calling them dogs and the uncircumcised. The Gentiles and even the half-Gentile Samaritans were viewed as enemies to be avoided. Here's the point if we read uh, John chapter 4, verse 9. When our Lord Jesus Christ interacted with the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So by the time we reach the book of Acts, 
we realize that God is bringing the church on a movement and on a pattern of growth, on a growth journey. The church was being formed and was growing from Jerusalem and ultimately was to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. However, before the church was able to fulfill this role, the church had to shed the exclusivism that was connected to Judaism. This brings us from Acts chapter 8 to, to 9, all the way now to Acts chapter 10, where the beginning of the gospel to Rome begins with two visions. Acts chapter 10 verses 1 to 16 records for us what I cheekily put as double vision. Eh? Actually, it's two visions. The first is to Cornelius, and the next is to the Apostle Peter. Verse 1 to 16, and it reads, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generally to the people, generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw he clearly he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God came in and said to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have extended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to him, had departed, he, he, called to two, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among them who attended him. And having related everything to them, he, said, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, when they were on their way, their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw heavens, the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter says, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Right at the first verse, Caesarea gave us rich insights of where Peter was going to go to, where the gospel was going to go to, but he also gave us insights of the, di of the distinctions that divide. You see, Caesarea was a seaport on the Mediterranean coast that was rebuilt by Herod the Great and was named after Caesar Augustus. It was the center of the Roman administration uh, or the province uh, in Palestine. It was the center, uh, you can say, of a showcase of Roman culture and there was even a temple there dedicated to Caesar. The Jews, however, hated Caesarea, not only because, well, it was under the Roman rule, but largely, but also because there was a large population of Gentile there, more than the, uh, that the population of the Jews. So that didn't help either. They were called Caesarea, the daughter of Edom, you know, and were not considered as a part of Jude, uh, Judea. This hatred, in, historically, will boil over in AD 66. And if you put it into context, that's around the time of Acts chapter 20 verse, uh, to all the way to Acts 28. A historian, a Jewish historian by the name of Joseph, Josephus recorded for us that there were riots between the Jews and the Gentiles that sparked the Jewish war against, the, against Rome. Josephus also claimed that the Jewish population, about 20,000 of them in Caesarea, was massacred in AD 66. So we can understand now uh, the, the hatred or in a sense the, the disdain or discrimination that the Jews had against Caesarea. Now from Caesarea, the Bible tells us in Acts 10, came a man called Cornelius who had a vision. <laughs> Cornelius was not only from Caesarea, he was a centurion and he was a Gentile. So verse 2 tells us that Cornelius was a man who is God-fearing. Now the term God-fearing uh, can mean a person who uh, attended the synagogue, who honoured the Jewish laws and customs, but may not have been incorporated in the Jewish community through circumcision. 
And some of these God-fearer Gentiles were attracted to the Jewish ethics, the theolo Jewish theology and worship, but they themselves may not have become uh, proselytes. Uh, pros 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 so devout was Cornelius. The Acts chapter 10 verse 30 tells us that Cornelius was praying uh, on the ninth hour of the day, uh, which was actually one of the three traditional Jewish times of prayer. And that was the time that he got his vision. Cornelius actually represents a, a person who uh, is unsaved among an unreached people group who may be seeking God in an extraordinary way. And God sent Peter eventually, as we read through uh, Acts chapter 10, which by the way has 48 verses, one of the longest, uh, one of the longer uh, chapters in Acts. And God sent Peter to bring the gospel to Cornelius uh, through the angel who would tell Cornelius to summon Peter from Joppa in verses 5 to 6. However, let's pause here and think about this for a while here. This was a Gentile from a place that the Jews don't like, uh, where Gentiles hated. And this was a Gentile that was sending a messenger to ask Peter of a Jewish descent to come to the place to minister to a Gentile. Think about that. That is interesting. That is hurdles, divides after divides to cross. Now, remember earlier that I just said that before the church was to fulfill the role of bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth, the church had to overcome some of this device that was connected to Judaism. And so it began with Peter. And it began with the vision that Peter had from verse 9 to 16. This is the same Peter whom the keys of the kingdom was given, as we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And now was going to open an important door for the gospel to be brought to Caesarea and the Roman church to begin. In Acts chapter 10, we find Peter in Joppa heading up to the roof to pray. Now, the flat rooftops uh, of the Palestines were common places for prayer. Uh, it was a good place to pray because, firstly, when you go up to the rooftop, you're separated from the people in the household. And, of course, the sea breeze also helped. It's a cool place to pray, so to speak. Now, Peter received a vision uh, during the time. And it came at a, not a very good time from human perspective. It came at a time that is hungry, you know. I mean, if I put myself in Peter's shoe and I'm praying and I smell KFC somewhere in the living room, you know, and this happens at my home, especially during the COVID lockdown, you know. Uh, when, I'm doing, when we are doing our work and when we are cooking, and my wife will come out when she smells the good food and say, what are you cooking? And she'll distract herself from her work, you know, and say, I smell food, you know. And probably you can understand that's how Peter would have felt when he's praying and then he smell, you know, I, I don't think they have KFC during that time, but perhaps, you know, whatever the food that he was smelling, and you would think that God would have chosen a better time to do so, but it was actually the best time because God had a vision about food. He gave a vision to Peter about food. And in Peter's vision, Peter saw, if I may be cheeky to say, a buffet spread coming down from heaven. The Bible tells us that it was all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. So when this buffet spread was coming down, Peter received a command to kill and eat in verse 13. This probably wouldn't have been a problem for us, you know, and I know this because I went out with some of the young adults, Fred included, and we went for a buffet, and wow, you should see the food that we were eating. No issue whatsoever in terms of what we are restricted to eat. But for Peter, it's different. Peter is a Jew. For Jews, some animals were considered uh, unclean, therefore not suitable for the Jews to eat. And here, the entire animal world was symbolized here in this vision. Both clean, so-called unclean animals were included. You know, for the Jews, the dietary laws were not just a matter of adequate or preference, you know, dietary preferences or habits. They are a matter of survival and identity. Peter's response was typical of Peter when he saw the food. He, 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 and when he was told to, eat, to kill and eat, you know, he, Peter is the type that wears his thoughts and emotions on his sleeve or plainly, as per se, you know. And he said this, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. 
Let me digress a little because there's a fun fact here. I find it humorous that Peter would actually respond, calling God Lord, but then refusing to obey the one he calls Lord. It's interesting. But he also, but this little fun fact also lets us show how intense, how serious this restriction is to the Jews. That to the very fact that he will answer God in such a manner. So serious and intense was this situation or this vision that, it, that the Bible tells us it happened three times. But it also gets to show us, because it happened three times, it goes to show us how God was intent, equally intense, about breaking the divides to make a breakthrough in the divides, in the distinction that divided and prevented the gospel from advancing. The two visions have one thing in common. In order for the gospel to advance, the distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles that divided has to now be, have to now be broken. Breaking the distinctions that divided. Distinctions are good. When one, they are biblical. Two, when they are rightly applied. For example, if I use the word Baptist as an acronym, uh, B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, uh, I don't know whether you remember from your baptism class. Uh, I do. Uh, that's 18 years ago. B stands for uh, biblical authority. A stands for the autonomy of the local church. Uh, P stands for priesthood of all believers. Uh, T, and I better not get it wrong, it's quite embarrassing. Uh, T stands for two uh, ordinances, the Lord's Supper and baptism. I stands for individual soul liberty. Okay. S stands for uh, saved, oh, I almost forgot that one, saved, baptized membership. T stands for two officers, pastors, or the e or equivalent word will be overseers, elders, and deacons. And S stands for separation of church and state. Now, of course, if you're here physically, I'm sure you will clap your hands uh, for the effort that I put in. And I did, did and then and I didn't refer to the notes that I had here so that you, I would show you that, yes, I do remember our biblical Baptist distinctive. And you notice I say the word biblical Baptist distinctive because what is beautiful about our distinctive is that they are biblically based. They're based on the Bible. And distinctives are beautiful because they help us forge unity, gives us a clear idea of who we are and reminds us that we are set apart from the world. What is bad is when mankind twists this uh, biblical distinctive, this, this, sorry, this, when mankind twists the distinctive, adds our own human distinctives to it, makes it prideful, make it become uh, elitism, make it become exclusivism, without understanding or without going back to the Bible and understand God's original intent. Worse still is when distinctives are used by mankind to hinder, to divide people and to prevent them from coming to God or hinder them from coming to God. The distinctive brought up in the vision to Peter was the one about common, clean or unclean food in verse 14. Although the NIV translated uh, impure, uh, the um, verse to impure or unclean food. Un the word common would have been a literal word as we see in ESV. Common uh, means to reject, despise, taboo. It's a way of being so distinct that you have divided. You know, regarding this clean and unclean food, it is from Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24 to 26 that records for us and God tells us that by I have said to you, you shall inherit their land and I will give it to you in pos in pos to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the people. You shall therefore separate the clean beasts from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. The whole idea uh, that these purity laws uh, may have been needed at one stage of history for God's people. So Israel 
uh, in the time of the Old Testament, uh, God has called them to be separate, to be distinct from the nations around them. Now, the Bible does not really record for us why. Perhaps it's due to hygiene, health reasons, or perhaps it's a matter, it's due to identity. Now, if, if I am to, I, I kind of wish that you are here in the congregation, then I can ask for your help. Because, for example, if you are present here, I would have asked you, if you, when you think of pasta, which is the people group that you think of? The Italians, thank God for the worship team that is here with me. The Italians, when you think of sushi, for example, you will think of which people group? The Japanese, thank you. When you think of kimchi, you think of the Koreans. Now, if you think of, my wife will tell you, if you think of Hokkien Mee, you think of me, okay? Because that's, that's my favorite food, okay? But you see from here, even with just such simple illustration, certain food we realize is, is tied in with not only just a nation, but we also the people within the nation. So when we think of God giving the, the laws, to, the purity laws to the people back in the time of the Old Testament, most likely due to uh, uh, multiple factors, both practical and symbolic, it contributed to certain food not being consumed to allow Israel to be distinct from the nations that is around them. Now, this, this brings me to the next point about clean and common or unclean people. Because, in, because Cornelius of Caesarea is considered as someone who is common or unclean. Why? Because food is linked with people group. So the Jews started to think through the years as we advance from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you start to think of, start to think of people who consume such food as clean or unclean. This only forms one side of the prejudice. The other side, of course, is by being distinct, uh, instead of drawing the nations to know God, their distinction or their view of distinction has separated them from the rest of the nations, has divided them from the rest of the nations. So it's from their view, instead of drawing people, they kept themselves exclusive from people. The animals in the visions are parabolic of human beings. God was preparing Peter to go into a predominantly Gentile area to preach to Gentiles and to open the, gospel, the door for the gospel to be preached there. So Peter will soon realize that he may not be able, he, he should not or he must not consider any group or any people uh, to, be uncom to be common or unclean. In verse 28, he will see the new in the old, so to speak. He will see the original intent of Israel and what we read from in the Old Testament with renewed eyes. This is why I would put there, we will see how the Old Testament will meet the New Testament and, how, and see how God has intended for the Gentiles to share in the blessings through Israel. Where the Old Testament meets the New or where the Old meets the New. You know, I, I love my, my Hebrew uh, lecturer, Dr. Scott Callahan. Uh, mainly because he has this view that the Bible is whole, that the Old Testament should not be unhinged from the New Testament. There's a, there's a mother pastor that I spoke to and he says this, I don't see it as Old Testament or New Testament, I see it as the Word of God. And we should see it as such as well, to see that Jesus has come to fulfill the law, not to abolish them, that he came to fulfill the promises of God. But, in all, but when we see that, then we will see how we had to see what was the original intent then of God asking His people uh, to be distinct. The real idea is that the people, the nations around them will ask, who is the God of this nation that the people live for? Who is the God of this nation that they will be so distinct, so different? Let us go and find out about this God. God has always intended for the people, for a distinct Israel to draw rather than the divine people. And the whole idea is because God had in mind the sharing of the blessings to the Gentiles. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, we see uh, as God spoke to Abraham, who was later known as Abraham, you will bless those who I bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All people. 
So the idea was through Abraham. It become a nation, a people that will become a blessing to the peoples. What about Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8 to 12? And I focus on verse 12 and it says, See, they will come from afar, some from the north, some from the west, some from the region of S1. Now, Isaiah chapter 49 may be intended to speak of the remnant of those who are returning from all directions. But it also can be an indication of all the world, of the worldwide scope of the people that will be coming, Gentiles that of all sorts, all kinds, all places that will come and find restoration to God through His suffering servant. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, even as we read from Acts chapter 8 to 9, we see that even in Acts chapter 8 and 9, we see that the key conversions were Gentiles. And even Paul who was Saul, was converted and called to bring the gospel to who? The Gentiles. To share the blessings. It has always been God's intent from the Old Testament all the way to the New. The old meets the new. The sharing of the gospel and to be blessed with God, God Himself. To be reconciled to God. What we read in the Old Testament is being fulfilled in the New Testament through Christ. He is the one that breaks the divide. Christ breaks the divide. God was showing Peter through God's response to him. And so this is what God said. And a voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. God was showing Peter that the Jewish idea of anyone not conforming to their national standards of purity that could not be saved is no longer valid. Literally, verse 15 means you must stop considering it as common. The common, what was common was common no more because of Christ. These purity laws may have been needed, but they are no longer necessary for Gentiles to conform to these regulations. Why? If you read in Mark chapter 7, verse 18 to 20, it will make what God showed Peter perfect sense. Mark 7, verse 18 to 20, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. Thus he declared all foods clean. Those laws which has one defined, once defined Israel as a, a people of a certain ethnicity, a certain uh, political distinction from the world does not function the same way anymore. No one, no one is to be turned from the gospel, to be rejected, despised because of his ethnic origin or race or culture or even physical traits. You know, next week, the speaker will expound more on Peter defending this aspect of the Gentiles receiving the gospel. But I want to put to you that Ephesians chapter 2, chapter two verse 13 and 16, even as I move on, it shows us this. And it says, But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the laws of, the com of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross, to the cross, thereby killing the hostility. What a wonderful verse to remind us that the divide is broken. Question for us is that is this relevant to us today? After all, most of us Christians are Gentiles. So the specific issue facing the church in Acts do not apply to us. I put to you that while the specific issue may not apply to us, the general principle sure, sure, sure applies. God shows no partiality in verse 34. That is the kingdom of God 
in the kingdom of God, we may not categorize people according to their background, education, and so on. This calls for my third point, one attitude. And it's one attitude change that we see. Verse 17 to 48, and the word of God reads, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had might had seen might mean. Behold, the man who was sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one that you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have, what you have, to, say to, what you have to say. So he invited them to be in, to his guests. The next day he rose, went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the, day, and the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And Peter entered. Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And, he, and as he talked to him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to, to them, you, know, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of, of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any persons clean or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, the tenor by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all in the presence of God to hear all that he has been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I, I understand that God showed no partiality, but in every nation, everyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the, as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good, new, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourself know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John, had, John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those who oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country and of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day, made him appear not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate, drank with him, and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he, was, he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all, pro, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Verse 44, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he asked them, and, he, and they asked him to remain for, for some days. I know the, know the passage is very long and I'll do my best to narrow down to a few points that we want to focus on this morning. And if there's anything that we learn from the passage, we learn that it is Peter's openness to live with the uncomfortable that opened the gospel to be preached to the people. Peter was probably wondering, Peter was wondering and pondering about the vision. The word pondering in verse 19 uh, appears only here in the Bible. It means to think about something thoroughly and or seriously. So Peter was seeking God honestly despite his discomfort. Now time does not permit me to read to you uh, the poem. I'll leave you to read it on your own. But the idea for us is this. Are you and I as a church ready to be uncomfortable 
to grapple with what is uncomfortable. What is uncomfortable but biblical. So we're not asking us to compromise on what the Word of God says, but we are asking us to grapple with it. We are asking our stubborn hearts who can be, you know, the thing about our stubborn heart is this, our stubborn hearts can close our minds and refuse to listen to God's prompting towards change. And we're not talking about change just in terms of our change in the way we have built our church, change in lights, instruments, and technology. We're asking about change here uh, that is on the inside. A prejudice that divides, a distinction that divides, a distinction that is not biblical. So we're not saying that there's an openness to compromises either. We still need to speak the truth and love. But in order to love, we need to remove the prejudices and love our enemies. We need to remove the prejudices without removing the Word of God. To learn from God what it means to love but yet hold true to His Spirit's leading. We can see here the Word of God that is spoken to Peter and the Spirit of God that's, that as he was pondering allow him to be hospitable, to invite the Gentiles into his home. That was breaking the tradition, breaking his uh, comfort zone, breaking from his comfort zone and even his preferences that is not grounded in the Word of God. They become a stumbling block. They can become a stumbling block for the advancement of the gospel. All this was broken. And within that openness to what was uncomfortable, it took Peter on a journey to meet up with Cornelius. It took, it would take us on a journey to meet our Cornelius, so to speak. This openness resulted first in a repentance. Acts chapter 10, verse 28 to 29. When Peter finally met Cornelius in verse 28, we see that he readily admitted his prejudices. And then when he preached to the crowd in verse 34, he, pro- he confessed what he had learned. And the healing of any relationship, the bridging of any divide begins with what? Repentance. So to grapple with what is uncomfortable to the point that he repented and the attitude of repentance broke down not only prejudices, but most importantly, it opened the door for the ministry to those that we are prejudiced about. It is not easy, but it is needed. You know, it's sad to say that when we see in certain nations, the Christians, in certain nations, the Christian community have a bad record of, uh, in certain nations, of course, of areas of prejudice, condoning race, uh, caste, um, classes, you know, educational distinctions. But what about us? I'm sure I, you have a fair share of, this, of prejudices as, as much as I do. Right? Um, even in my, our casual jokes, for example, some prejudices that we have against certain races, we see in our jokes. I don't like it. I, I don't like um, racist jokes but I also don't like it when I respond to racist jokes. It shows a side of me that has this thought pattern, this prejudice. It reveals to me how I view others as common. It reveals to me how I don't treat certain people, foreigners, with the same way that God will have loved them. Perhaps it isn't to a certain people group, but perhaps sometimes it can be to a certain person or certain individual, certain personality type even. And in the coming chapter, we will see, uh, and the next speaker will bring us through how Peter went above and beyond and he spoke up for these people. But back to us at this time in chapter 10, as we reflect, as we repent, God will bring us to overcome those prejudices and into acceptance. So today I want to ask, which is the prejudice, the people group, that you most avoid preaching the gospel to? God is going to open the door to that. And He might ask you to do the same. He might ask you to do the same. Time has caught up with me as I go into the, point, into the last po- point. And that is to the point of acceptance. You know, Peter has accepted the people. When you see in verse 34, he begins his evangelistic message to the people. You know that Peter has accepted the people when he invited the Jews to his home in verse 28. In, in, that when he, sorry, when he went to the Jewish, the Gentile homes in verse 38 and it was crowded, something you cannot see during COVID-19 now, right? 
And you know, when Peter was giving the altar call, so to speak, you know, we, we see how God has opened the door and the people have accepted Christ. In verse 44, it says, while Peter was still saying this thing, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. So as the word of God was being preached to Peter who had crossed that divide, who had accepted the Gentiles, you see what God was doing through Peter. It's really amazing what God can do to you and me. So I look at our ministry, I realize that we're going to reach to the people in the heartlands. They're going to be people who are of a different mindset. They don't read the scriptures as fast or, with, uh, or as educated as we do or as profound as some of us do. Uh, they take time, perhaps. They need time to read. And there'll be people from all walks of life that'll be coming in. And God is calling us into that grappling of the uncomfortable, into that repentance for the areas that He surfaced that we are prejudiced against, or we are drawn to divide, and into the acceptance of the people that is coming in, so that the gospel can penetrate the people group whom we live around here. You know, earlier I talked about my friend's church. My friend never gave up. He prayed for his church, was patient with the people and the incoming youths. He was patient with the church as he was with the incoming youths. He worked hard and through a time of prayer, God raised a group of Peters who captured a vision of their, on their rooftop prayers and served alongside him to make a difference. Today, his church is making inroads to reaching youths in the heartlands. It's not always smooth sailing, nor is the work complete, but the doors are certainly open. I wonder, shall we open some doors today? Perhaps in response, as I invite the worship team to come forward, perhaps in response, God was calling you to surrender your prejudices. You say, these are the people group that I'm prejudiced against. It is time to change. Perhaps God is calling you who have already surrendered your prejudices, who is building bridges, and when the time comes where the restrictions are eased, to have the evangelistic hospitality that Peter had in verse 23, to invite the people that he was once prejudiced against and start embracing them. Not on our terms, by the way, but on God's terms. Not on our truth, by the way, but on God's truth. Invite us to close our eyes, bow our heads. We're going to sing this song very soon as I close in prayer and then we respond with this song. And, what, and I was searching for a song that would adequately reveal to us and this song struck me the most. You know, it's quite hard to find a song that talks about breaking the prejudices but the first song that the Lord brought to mind was this song, Hallelujah to the Lamb. And I love it when the chorus says, when the verse says, humbly we bow and pray. You know, we are the children called by your name. We are able to stand. We are stand by grace in your presence, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We are your children called by your name. Distinct. Humbly we bow and pray, just like Peter on the rooftop. But like Peter, to open the doors to the ministry, we ask the Lord to release His power to work in us and through us. Till we are changed to be more like you. But not just so that we are for our, so that the gospel is for ourselves. The song says, then all the nations will see your glory revealed and worship you. Every, tri every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, every people group, even the one that we are prejudiced against. Every, every, every land giving honour, giving glory, giving praise unto the Lamb of God. Dear God, long as this sermon might be, long as these verses might be, but short is our life. Shorter still is our time on earth to make an impact. So let us cast aside, oh God, anything that hinders us. Let's run this race to the fullest. Let us reach down to every people from every land. Help us overcome, reveal to us our prejudices and ask, God, we forgive us. 
forgive me for the people group that I'm prejudiced against. Change us and release your mighty work in us and open these doors that build bridges, that draws men unto yourself and still divine. In Jesus' name we pray.